to The Cup, where we will be spilling all sorts of tea about what's going on inside Washington, D.C., what regulators and lawmakers are thinking about and working on, and what your credit union should be considering in terms of risk areas and potential areas for opportunity. I'm your host, Ann Petro, SNAFU's Vice President of Regulatory Affairs, and today I'm joined by a very special guest. It's Representative Ed Perlmutter, uh, who is the Democratic Representative for Colorado's 7th District and Chairman of the House Financial Services Committee Subcommittee on Consumer Protection and Financial Institutions. Representative Perlmutter uh, recently announced his retirement, so I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to chat with you today, Representative Perlmutter. Uh, We'll be talking about marijuana banking and your signature bill, the SAFE Act, Uh, and and this issue of of marijuana banking is something that I know a lot of credit unions have questions about. Yes, uh, and thanks for having me on your show, and uh, it's great to be here, and Yeah, obviously, uh, I've worked a lot on the Safe Banking, Safe Act uh, with credit unions all across the country, but particularly here in Colorado. And so there are a lot of questions, but uh, really, uh, credit unions have really helped me shape the bill. Uh, It was uh, not at their insistence, but at their urging that I really take a look at this particular subject because folks could not get legitimate financial services if they were working with any kind of a cannabis business, anything that had to do with THC. So um, really at at the urging of the the credit union uh, industry, we took up the mantle. So I'm happy to talk about it as, uh, as you see fit. Sure. Yeah. Well, like you have been a fierce supporter um, and champion of of clarity and regulatory certainty for financial for financial institutions uh, that service marijuana related businesses. And you know, I'd love to hear from you why this is such an important issue for you. Well, let's just sort of take it back to the to the beginning. In the beginning, we'll go all the way back to 1971. When anything with THC, uh, so cannabis, marijuana, anything with THC was described to be illegal for all purposes under the Controlled Substance Act. And so it's treated as a Schedule I drug, same as heroin, methamphetamines, and you can't uh, buy or sell it, you can't finance it, you can't provide really any kind of uh, business services, you can't sell it, smoke it, eat it. Uh, under the federal law, but states have taken a completely different path. And that path is to open up uh, the cannabis industry and cannabis usage in a much wider way. Starting in Colorado in uh, 2012, the people of our state, uh, by an initiative, voted um, pretty overwhelmingly to allow for the legal use of cannabis for adults. And at that time, we knew there was going to be a collision between the state laws and the Federal Controlled Substance Act, particularly within the financial services industry, because most of financial services are regulated under federal law. And we were right. Uh, Barney Frank could see this, that there would be a lot of cash generated and we would have some real public safety uh, issues where There would be armed robberies, theft, burglaries. We've had murderers uh, here in Colorado recently, a spate of them in uh, Washington and along the West Coast. So this is a public safety matter first, and it's just a basic business issue. Uh, Second, that businesses that are legitimate in their states ought to be able to get legitimate financial services, whether it's checking accounts, insurance, payroll accounts, Uh, credit cards. And that's the purpose of this bill. And we're now at 48 states, plus all the territories in the District of Columbia have some level of cannabis use. Uh, And that's why we got to get something done here. Mm -hmm. So as more and more states started to, you know, create their own laws around uh, the use of of cannabis or or marijuana and possession uh, and, and creating, you know, medical uh, marijuana or cannabis systems is, is that would you say when you know Congress started to take 
notice and and start thinking about what a banking system would look like because really you know the the payment side of all of this is an issue as well so congress really didn't take notice as a whole until about three or four years ago so the SAFE Act uh, is something that uh, I helped draft along with Denny Heck, a congressman from uh, the state of Washington. He's now the lieutenant governor of the state of Washington. And we started on this thing back in 2013. And for a long time, we really got uh, nowhere. I mean, we, we dealt with what I call the chuckle factor. And for me, the chuckle factor is if I brought up this subject, that this was really a, a public safety matter and a business matter, you know, people say, oh, I had, you're from Colorado, you're a mile high. You know, but over the course of the last three or four years, with the assistance of the credit unions, other financial institutions, insurance companies, real estate, uh, the minority cannabis industry, um, and really a lot of effort on behalf of members of Congress, the House certainly has uh, seen how important a piece of legislation this is. It's not, you know, climate change. It's not the war in Ukraine. It's not those kinds of things, but it really is a matter that has to be solved under federal law. And we brought it now to the Senate. We passed it out of the House seven times with substantial uh, bipartisan support, pretty much every Democrat and then uh, over 100 Republicans supporting this. And it's kind of it's gotten stalled uh, in the Senate under both Republican uh, leadership as well as Democratic leadership. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with this passing most recently as an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act, you know, there, it's been in the news again. Uh, and how do you, you know, find a way as a Democrat to to build bipartisan support for the SAFE Act um, and, and steer it through the House. And then, you know, what is it like working with the Senate to try to get, you know, people on the same page? So, you know, for me as a member, I mean, I'd say the, the biggest uh, factor in quality is being persistent and reminding people of the public safety aspect of this reminding them that legitimate businesses ought to have legitimate financial services. But it's much broader than that. That's helped a lot in the House. But really, the, the thing that has done it is the effort by credit unions and their members, uh, other financial services industry uh, partners, to say this is something that needs to get solved. And it can be solved. And so there's been a real effort, uh, grassroots, uh, to bring this to a, the attention of members of the House and members of the Senate. And so I've been lucky to have you know great bipartisan uh, colleagues as my main co-sponsors. So uh, David Joyce from Ohio and Warren Davidson from Ohio have Republicans have been great uh, partners in moving this forward. Earl Blumenauer. Uh, who has really been the quarterback of cannabis-related matters for a long time, congressman out of Oregon, as well as uh, Nydia Velasquez, uh, congresswoman from New York City. They've been great partners in helping me in the House. And then we've got two excellent sponsors in the Senate who I have gathered about 40 or more uh, co-sponsors. And the Democrat is Jeff Merkley from Oregon, and the Republican is Steve Daines, from Montana. So having uh, good co-sponsors and working together as a team makes a real difference. And then you add the efforts from the outside groups, from the credit unions and their members, it makes a difference and people start listening and start, you know, developing uh, their approach or opinion about it. Teamwork makes the dream work, right? Isn't that the saying? <laughs> <laughs> I, I had not heard that, but if you don't mind, I'm going to copy that. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, but, you know, you've still got the challenge of the divided Senate. So, you know, even with the the co-sponsors and other supporters, how do you move it through the Senate? <laughs> well, that is the $64 <laughs> question. But I think uh, we're at a point where we now can do this. And so just, to, again, stepping back for a second, uh, we passed the SAFE Act 
to the Senate three years ago when the Republicans were in the majority in the Senate. And then Senator Crapo was in charge of the banking committee at that point. And for him and for the Republicans, the bill was too big and too broad. They really didn't want to take up anything dealing with marijuana or cannabis or THC. Uh, Democrats then win the majority, slim as it is, uh, where it's 50-50 and Kamala Harris uh, breaks the tie, but we figured something would happen. Then it turned out for Democrats, or at least those that were really kind of engaged in the subject, uh, the bill was too limited and too narrow. They wanted to see it broader. They wanted to see a criminal justice component to it. They wanted to see uh, what they thought would be a need for more equity for minority businesses. And so then it stalled out in the Senate under Democrats. Uh, Cory Booker and uh, Chuck Schumer and Ron Wyden recently introduced their bill, which is a sweeping comprehensive piece of marijuana legislation uh, that is far broader than the uh, SAFE Act uh, and has a lot of great components. I certainly can support it. I think it's a good piece of legislation. I just don't think they've got enough votes in the mm -hmm. Senate uh, to pass that bill. But I do think there are plenty of votes, Democrats and Republicans, to pass safe banking and to add a few things that I think will encourage and motivate some of the Democrats who wanted to see a broader bill uh, to see it move forward. Okay. So, I mean, there have been some reports of, you know, requests for additions to the SAFE Act that would address, you know, issues of racial inequity, um, social justice reform, things of that nature. So, you know, are those amendments that you're, you know, willing to entertain and incorporate and, and is, how, how might that help move, move the needle? Well, that's a very good question. Um, you know, within the bill already, we think, and the minority cannabis industry has been very supportive of uh, SAFE Act and has testified in the House, testified in the Senate uh, to try to get this going because without any kind of uh, law in this area, uh, minorities are particularly hard hit in terms of opening new businesses and stuff. But uh, we could see, you know, adding uh, minority uh, development, MDIs and CDFIs, community development, financial institutions, which are more focused on the minority communities, let them have a little broader role. Obviously, credit unions are going to play a big part of that if this is uh, broadened. Um, David Joyce and uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, so Republican and Democrat, have a bill that would assist district attorneys across the country in cleaning up their records and, if they so chose at a local level, uh, expunge the records for minor infractions, which really make it difficult for individuals to get jobs with the federal government, to right. work in the marijuana industry, those kinds of things. So there are a number of pieces that could be added to safe banking that I think would appeal to both Democrats and Republicans and would help move it forward in the Senate. If it gets too broad, then you start losing votes in the Senate. And, uh, you know, my goal is to get this thing uh, passed in the next few months before, as you said, before I uh, end my uh, time in Congress on January 2nd, because the new Congress is sworn in on January 3rd. Right. So you don't think something as broad as, you know, let's say removing marijuana from the Controlled Substances Act really has a shot? No, I think, you know, which would be, uh, you know, a very simple uh, solution to all this or just generally legalizing it or descheduling it, uh, which is what Cory Booker and Chuck Schumer and Ron Wyden have suggested in their bill. Um and it's very simple and pretty elegant solution, except they don't have the votes for it. Uh, I think it's too much for uh, a number of the Republicans and even a few Democrats. So, you know, I think we could put together a substantial bill, add some pieces, maybe involving research, because under uh, the Controlled Substance Act, you really can't even research this stuff to find out, is it truly effective uh, dealing with pain, you know, how much is too much, right, standardizing right. it, things like that. 
allowing the Veterans Administration to prescribe it for uh, vets who are dealing with uh, PTSD. So there are pieces that I think can be added that don't lose votes and actually make the whole bill better. Uh, but it can get too broad. And then I think uh, there's problems moving it in the Senate. We start to lose people. Yeah. Um, you know, you've talked a lot about the critical role that credit unions have played in, in moving, you know, this forward and, and supporting this effort. And, you know, could you speak a little bit to the role generally of grassroots advocacy in the legislative process and, you know, specifically how communication from constituents can get members to support legislation like the SAFE Act? Well, let's talk about what really accomplished a lot. So back when Colorado legalized in 2012 and then 2013, um, we went to the Obama administration because a number of credit unions here in uh, Colorado in the Denver area said, look, you know, folks want to uh, come to us for, for financial services, but we really are reluctant to provide those services. What can you do? I said, well, let's let's talk to the administration, see what happens. So the Obama administration was unwilling to just deschedule it. But what they said was, uh, under what's called the Cole Memo and the FinCEN guidance, look, if you keep the if you keep marijuana out of the hands of kids, that there's no evidence of uh, organized crime, that there is transparency, uh, then we will uh, put the financial um, institution at the lowest level of enforcement, you know, because we've got, you know, uh, really difficult crime to deal with and and uh, violent crime. So we'll put it down here. It's called the Cole Memo and the FinCEN guidance came out under the Obama administration. And then and credit unions were key in in terms of their uh, helping us uh, build those memos and and working with Treasury and working with uh, the Department of Justice. And so the grassroots first saying, hey, we got a problem here. We think we can help uh, fix it, um, made a difference in putting together these guidances, which are not the law. The guidances can be revoked, just as Jeff Sessions did when he came in as the attorney general for Donald Trump. Uh, thank goodness uh, Steve Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, maintain the FinCEN guidance, as has Je under Trump, and then Janet Yellen has under uh, Joe Biden. So people are still able to provide some services, but it's you know a lot of compliance problems, a lot of uh, difficulties, and that's why we need to make it the law. So that's why credit unions and their members need to keep knocking on the members' doors in the Congress and in the Senate. <laughs> that's that's really really helpful and you know i think a lot of of credit unions are just nervous about like you said the compliance risks and general risks associated with you know servicing businesses that are engaging with a product that is federally illegal so i mean you could lose access to your fed reserve master account you could lose your charter uh i mean there are a lot of you know, potential outcomes that would be devastating. But, you know, that's that's the, the worst one. Mm -hmm. The worst one is if it's deemed to be money laundering. Right. And the CEO goes to jail. All right. That's the worst one. But with these guidances, that risk is much smaller. Mm -hmm. But we need to get it to zero by getting this law passed and and uh eliminating some of these compliance burdens. We're still going to want to make sure under the SAFE Act that there is no organized crime involved, that kids can't get their hands on uh, cannabis or marijuana, that there is a transparency here, uh, particularly so that the, the government, the licensing agencies can see what's going on with, with the, the finances of the marijuana businesses. Mm -hmm. And what would you say to critics who who might say that, you know, things are working just fine in their state right now. And, you know, the system is operating, they're able to work within, you know, the constraints and the rules and requirements within their state and comply with all the rules. And they feel comfortable with the status quo, as is, even though federally, you know, there's there's not the same 
system for financial institutions in place? Well, I would say to those people, and that uh, that's nice for them to say, except people are getting killed. Mm -hmm. They're getting robbed because there still is so much cash in a one week period in Oakland, California, last fall, last November, 25 dispensaries faced armed robberies. Wow. We had three murders in the state of Washington in May. Uh, Colorado, we continued to have uh, robberies, armed robberies. And so the public safety element of this is it can't be overlooked. And there's a way to solve it, which is to allow for, you know, transactions that are not just in cash. And that attracts a lot of trouble. And we've seen it. So, you know, to those people who say, oh, this is not a big deal. Well, they haven't been robbed recently, but I can tell you if they go talk to some other folks, they're going to find out that there still are a lot of robberies. Right. Yeah. The, the public safety concern is is definitely you know top of the list. And if Visa and MasterCard could, you know, change their agreements to to allow you know, electronic digital transactions to take place without fear of, you know, the federal government knocking on their door and, and saying, hey, what do you think you're doing? This is illegal. Uh, that, that would certainly smooth things over. No, exactly right. There's a big section in the bill uh, dealing with credit cards. And I actually had a meeting yesterday with the chairman of uh, Visa, and this was one of the subjects we talked about. And even with respect to hemp, which was made legal under the agriculture bill of 2018 or 2019, the credit card uh, businesses are still nervous because there's, there's a level of THC in hemp and the credit card companies don't want to have to become chemists mm -hmm. to figure that out. And so they still need the safe Harbor. And I worked with a Republican, Andy Barr, who's a friend of mine. He and I, agree on some things, we disagree on other things, but we worked on this uh, credit card section of the SAFE Act so that it would work for both cannabis and hemp. Right. Yeah, that, that certainty would be really helpful because you know we've heard that concern from credit unions too. They're like, we don't have chemists on staff that can, you know, analyze whether something is above, you know, the legal limit. Uh, so... That, that is reasonable. Um, so, you know, as our audience may know, you, and like I mentioned earlier, have announced your retirement, you know, at the end of this congressional term. Um, and I know that credit unions are certainly going to miss your work as a credit union champion over the many years. Uh, as you approach the end of your time in Congress, you know, what are you most proud of? And, and what, if anything, do you regret uh, what would you do differently, I guess, both within you know, the financial services realm and more broadly? That's a good question. So I say I'm most proud of, um, and if this is outside of the financial services arena, I, uh, I helped a lot with the building of a new veterans hospital here in Colorado. Our prior hospital was really in bad shape, and it was a struggle to get it built, and the Appropriations were not easy and there were construction problems, but it's now the best hospital in the world for veterans. And it serves the veterans of Rocky Mountains, of the Rocky Mountains from Montana to New Mexico. So that's, that's fantastic. That's one. The sec second one, again, outside of the financial services realm, is um, I serve on the science committee and I'm kind of a, you know, Star Trek, Star Wars uh, nerd. And uh, I've been working for a long time to get our astronauts to Mars by 2033 when the orbits of Earth and Mars are, uh, you know, uh, at the shortest distance. So it saves a lot of space travel. It's much safer uh, for our astronauts as they travel to Mars. And so I've been working on that and was able to keep the program going when it looked like uh, it was going to be cut about 10, 15 years ago. So I've been working on that. The other and I got to say, it's going to be safe when uh, we get this thing passed before the end of the year. I'm going to feel a real sense of accomplishment. I never set out uh, as a member of Congress to work on marijuana issues, but this is a problem that needs to be solved. And uh, I've been pretty persistent and will continue to persist uh, until this thing gets passed. So I'll feel good about that. In terms of regrets, 
Uh, I don't have too many regrets. I, I've loved being a member of Congress. I, uh, I like people and I like the issues that we deal with. Um, you know, I guess if I, if I were sad about something, it's just to see us over time having become more polarized. Mm -hmm. Now, in individual settings, like with SAFE, uh, you can really build some good, strong bipartisan coalitions. So you still, it's, it, you can, certainly can do it, and it's much more fun. But I think the regret would be to see, you know, the collapse of uh, some of that. Certainly, there's still plenty, and uh, that's what's kept me in the game so long. Uh, but that would be the one sort of overall regret. Other than that, uh, you know, it's uh, it's been a good run for me, and I got to tell you, the credit unions have been so supportive of my service. Uh, and I just want to thank uh, those listening and, and viewing this podcast. But I've had such strong and enthusiastic support from credit unions from the get-go when I served in the state legislature and then as a member of Congress. And I just want to thank you and, and everybody who's listening or viewing uh, this podcast. No, oh, thank you. Well, we've en enjoyed giving that support and thank you for all the work that you've done for, for credit unions. Uh, and, you know, my last question is, what does the future look like for you? What are your what are your plans? What's next? Well, my wife would like to know that, too. Um, <laughs> I would say uh, I've been talking to a couple uh, major law firms that have Denver and Washington connections. Because uh, before I got elected to Congress, I did a lot of big chapter 11 work. I don't think that's where my value is anymore. It's going to be on government relations in Denver and in D.C. And I've been talking to a couple lobby shops. And then I've also considered going out on my own and doing that, which is kind of a, a scary uh, thought, but uh, something that uh, I'm considering. So it's all good. There are a lot of opportunities for me. Uh, we just had another, our fourth uh, grandchild little girl uh, Penelope a couple oh congratulations six weeks ago you know so I can be a you know a grandpa too so that's that's another thing that I'm looking forward to yeah spending more time with family is definitely a huge plus uh, but what, what about a uh, lobbying shop that's focused on you know marijuana reform is that an option well, my <laughs> guess, uh, that would be probably part of um uh, the subject matter, but I don't know, you know, we'll see what it brings, but I certainly would uh, take a look at that. I've been working on it a long time now right. and uh, really want to see this thing get passed. And I either using safe banking as kind of a central part of a broader bill um, is one approach. And then the other approach is to keep it in the National Defense Authorization Act, which I did not do and we did not do last year. The Republicans in the Senate uh, objected. And we ended up ultimately um, allowing it to be eliminated in the House. But that's still another avenue mm -hmm. of a bill that has to be passed by year end uh, to keep it in connect in that. And I don't mean to be so persistent and such a, uh, you know, stuck on this thing, but I am going to get this damn thing passed. <laughs> All right. Well, we like to hear that. And it sounds like there are several avenues available for it to pass. So we're looking forward to seeing what happens before the end of the year. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. I probably shouldn't have cussed. I'm sorry about that to you. <laughs> listening. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, no problem. Well, unless you have any any final remarks for our viewers, that, that does it for this episode of The Cup. So thank you again, Representative Perlmutter, for joining me. It's It's been an honor and pleasure to chat with you about this important topic. Well, just thanks for having me on. This has been fun. Absolutely. And that's it for this episode of The Cup. Thank you all so much for joining and stay tuned for more exciting discussions on a number of interesting topics. Until next time.